Hello, and welcome to the Stop Devaluation Podcast. I'm your host and founder of the Stop Devaluation Movement, Melody Hilton. The heart of this movement is to see the value in all of humanity and live courageous lifestyles of using our power for good instead of harm. We can affect change by choosing validation over judgment, and I hope you'll take your place and make a positive impact in this world. The byproduct of shame and devaluation are negative fear-based emotions. Science reveals that this builds neural memory three times faster and establishes beliefs based upon that fear. These sociological and psychological fears scream lies that cause us to believe and function opposite of who we truly are. Melody Seaton knows exactly how that feels. But the innate voice of who she was and what she could accomplish as an educator continued to propel her forward to bring courage to the melodies of this world to see beyond their experience and discover the valuable treasure they hold. Welcome, everyone, to the Stop Devaluation Movement, My Story, with Melody Seaton. Thank you so much for being with us, Melody. Thank you so much for having me. I'm not used to interviewing a Melody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is very interesting and unique. <laughs> well, with that said, uh, I would love to hear your story. I know everyone has faced injustice. Everyone has faced uh, situations that just hurt their heart and even began to develop lies uh, that they believed about themselves. So could you share with me your story? Yes, I would love to do that. Thank you. First, um, it occurred to me that I was born in 1957, and in the first decade of my life, there were very significant um, things that happened globally um, that affected me uh, indirectly, Mm. Um, you know, such as uh, President Kennedy was assassinated in 1963, and he was certainly someone who was valued in the African-American community Mm -hmm. for his work for justice. Uh, The Civil Rights Act was passed in 1964, and the Voters' Rights Act was passed in 1965. That same year, Malcolm X was assassinated. And the year after my 10th birthday, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was Mm. also assassinated. Mm. So there were all these things that were going on, and as a child, I certainly did not understand the full implication of them. But I would hear the adults discussing it. I I heard the tears that were shed as they would talk about each of these significant people in the fight for justice uh, being brutally, um, you know, killed because of uh, their stance that they took um, against the very topic that we are discussing this morning. And so during that first decade of my life, um, even though I was not truly aware, there were certain things I was aware of. Um, We could not ride past a certain area where we lived. And I grew up in Chicago. So we're not talking about the South where my parents were from, Mm. because I knew how I had to act when we went to the South. But in the North, (laughs) where we were supposed to be really experiencing what freedom and justice was all about, my sisters and I were told very clearly that we were not to go across a certain street. Now, we didn't really understand why we couldn't. And because I was the eldest, and because I tended to always push the envelope, (laughs) I decided one day that I was going to go across the street, and the street was called Ashland Avenue. Um, There was a new McDonald's, and my dad would take us on rides a lot, and we would ride into neighborhoods, 
that we could not live in, uh, could not walk in. And I saw this McDonald's and I loved McDonald's like most children did. And so I told my, my middle sister, I said, look, we're going to go to McDonald's and we're not going to the one we normally go to. So we, I put her on my bike and we went and picked up another girlfriend of mine and we rode. I made the mistake of not staying on busy streets. Um, I went down a residential street and when I made a turn toward my destination, which was McDonald's, um, it was a nice summer day and people were out on their porches and uh, having fun. But all of a sudden, my sister and I and our friend became the focus and everybody stopped what they were doing. And all of a sudden, I began to hear the N word and N word, go home. I had never in my life heard that before. Wow. I had never been told that before. Now, again, as a child, I would hear my parents talk about different uh, situations, and it was hurtful. I knew it was hurtful by the way they would talk about it, but I had never experienced it. And I became very afraid, yeah. and I knew I had to take care of my sister. That was the most important thing. Well, my friend that went with us, she rode off immediately and left my sister and I in the middle of this street with people on both sides of the block screaming at us and hollering at us. And this is in the first decade of my life. And so all I could think to do was my dad had given me a chain to lock my bike up in a lock. And I, I took it off. I had the presence of mind to take it off and wrap it around my arm. And I held my sister really close behind me so that she could really barely see what was going on. She could hear it, but she couldn't see it. And I just trusted and had to believe that nobody would come near me because they would think that I would probably use what I had. And they did not, thank God. And at that point, I was able to get myself together to put my sister back on the bike and mm. fly home. That was really, um, that stuck with me a very, very long time. I had to do a lot of work to get through that particular situation. It caused me to be shy around mm. uh, Caucasians mm. um, because I didn't live near any Caucasians. Knew some, of course, because my mom worked with Caucasian people and we would be invited to their homes and they were so nice. They weren't like those people that would call you the N-word and, and threaten to do things to you. And, of course, negativity tends to yes. linger <laughs> you know, and you have to certainly do a lot more work to to get past that. And I took that into high school with me. Unfortunately, uh, the high school that was in the neighborhood where I grew up in, my mother did not feel that it was suitable academically or safe wise. So she um, sacrificed. She and my dad sacrificed, and they sent me to a Lutheran high school. Uh, we belonged to a Lutheran church, and um, some of my other friends were attending there. Well, this Lutheran school was 98% white. Mm. And so you're co I'm coming out of a neighborhood that's 100% African American. Yeah. And I'm going into a school that's 98% white with no preparation, no understanding. And that was traumatic. For two years, I was not very successful in high school because when we would, oftentimes when we would leave school, we would have to be escorted across the street. Now, wow. again, Melody, I have to keep reminding you, this is Chicago. Yeah. This is not the South. Yeah. And so this is 1971. And we would have to be ushered across the street by the school administration. And they would stand there until the bus came so that we could get on the bus because the high school around the corner, the public school around the corner, they would frequently come and they would want to attack us. Wow. It was so bad that the school would lock the doors. We could not, like most high school children can, you know, come out and go to lunch and all of those kinds of things. We were on a, a closed campus. Oh we could not leave the school. 
So school started, I think, at 8 o'clock or something like that, and we didn't get out till 3.30. We were in that building the entire time. Did that affect you academically? It did. It did. My high school years were very um, challenging. Um, my grades were horrible. I began to pull them up a little bit when I left that school, when I finally convinced my mom that it was just not psychologically a good place for Mm -hmm. me to be Um, because I was growing more and more angry. Mm -hmm. And so we're talking about the 70s, and we're also talking about an awakening in the African-American community. And so I was born, I think on my birth certificate, it says Negro or colored. And so uh, in the 70s, I became black. Mm -hmm. And there was the black power movement. So here I am confronting um, the very thing that people are marching against, and I'm just a child. Mm -hmm. And these seeds of, um, you know, you are not as good as I am Mm -hmm. are being planted. And no matter how much I tried, no matter how big my fro grew, you know, no matter how much I did the black power sign and any of those things, When somebody is telling you that you are no good, Mm -hmm. that you are not worthy, that uh, you are not as smart as I am, that wins out sometimes. Makes me want to cry. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I'm trying to hold it together while I tell you about it. You know, it reminds me of, in neuroscience, it says when we are afraid we become the opposite of who we are. So this beautiful Mm -hmm. treasure on the inside of you, there was a lid on that because of fear, because of these lies, because of believing that I'm not good enough. And it's so destructive to a a person's emotional health. And for you to go through that is just so heartbreaking. Thank you for, you know, sharing that from a neurological perspective, because that's exactly what happened. I cowered. Um, I was afraid to speak up in classes. Um, oftentimes, I knew the answer, but I just assumed that it was going to be wrong oh. because I had been made to feel um, that I was not worthy. And so those first two years of high school were really just a waste of my parents' money uh, because I really, I rarely got anything above a C. Um, most of my grades were D's and, and, um, I don't remember if I got any F's, but they were pretty close and it just took a lot of convincing because in my mom's uh, mind, she was sending me to something that was going to be better for me, but in actuality, it it really wasn't, Mm. but that was not, you know, that that she was doing what she thought was best. So I certainly don't fault her for that. It should have been a good experience. It should have been an academically challenging experience, but it was everything but that. Another thing that happened to me while I was at that particular high school, my parents went through a divorce in my sophomore year. And I could hear the conversations because, you know, back in the day, parents didn't really talk in front of children. You, you, didn't, you didn't really know what was going on. And so, uh, but I knew my mom was challenged financially to keep me at the school. And even though I kept saying to her, I don't need to keep going back here. She wanted me to go. So what I did was I snuck out and I got a job in a department store not too far from the school. And I would tell my mom that I was studying. I was also in track. And so I had these athletic things I was doing. And so I would tell her all of those things, but I had dropped out of all of that kind of stuff so that I could work. Um, And I was barely... I just made 15, I think. <laughs> um, and so I, but I, I told a story on my application because you had to be 16 in order to work. Oh. And I was hired. And so I would get the money and I saved it. We had savings accounts. My dad had opened up savings accounts for us when we were little bitty children. And so um, I knew how to get there and put my money in the bank and, you know, all that stuff. And so I was, my plan was, to present my mom with the money that I had earned so that she wouldn't have to worry mm-hmm. about how she was going to not only keep me at the school, 
but take care of my sisters and I. And what happened is my geometry teacher came into the store one Sunday. I was supposed to have been at a, a girlfriend's house when I was working. I was working in a cosmetic um, counter, and it was right at the door's opening. And he walked in, and he walked over to me, and he says, what are you doing here? And it was really nasty. Not, hello, you know, how are you? Mm -hmm. He says this in front of his family. What are you doing here? And I said, I am working. He said, but you're too young to work. And I just looked at him. I didn't say anything. That Monday, he went to the school administration, and he told them that I was working. They called the store, and they told them. And I was, I was going to get fired, but the manager was so awesome. Mm-hmm. She was one of those people that valued me. She was so wonderful. She told me that because I was so good at what I was doing, that she was going to let me work through the Christmas holiday. And she could have jeopardized her job. But they tried to get me fired. Wow. They never asked me why I was working. They just didn't want me to do this. And so not only did they not want me to do this, when the principal called me in his office to verify the story, he told me that I was going to go to hell. Oh, my. Because oh. I had lied to these people. Oh and this, my. you know, it was a Lutheran school, oh so yeah. we took religion and all of that. Um, but this is a man <laughs> who did not look like me, who mm. knew nothing about my story, mm. who never asked, why did you lie? Why were you working? He would have found out that I was trying to help my mom keep me in this lunatic asylum that was killing me, mm. that was robbing me of everything. But my mother wanted me to be there and I wanted to help her do that. So he told me I was going to go to hell and that really, oh my gosh, I, I thought being called the N word uh, was bad, but having somebody tell you that you were going to go to hell because you were trying to do something right wow, was really horrible. So that finally gave my mother, <laughs> what she convinced her that I did not need to be there. She was upset with me because I had lied to her about you know, where I was, and she talked about the danger of that. And of course, you know, but she was so, um, she was so taken aback that I wanted to do that yes. to help. And she thought it was so cruel of the school administration to tell me something like that. So I was able to leave that situation, and but it didn't, you know, two years of uh, high school. Um, was kind of a wash for me. Yeah. So I'm playing catch up. When I left there, I went to a public school, much better setting. Uh, even though it was mixed, it was mixed, uh, mostly Caucasian at the time, but it was just different. It, it was just very, very different. And, and people were so uh, nice. I never experienced anything um, uh, racially motivated, or at least I did not recognize it. If it was some kind of microaggression or something like that, I didn't recognize it. And I certainly knew what it was by that time. Um, Very affirming place. And I met a counselor because again, I'm, I'm trying to catch up Mm. and the seed of going to college had been planted by my dad that, you know, my sisters and I were going to college, even though when he started the conversation, we really didn't know what he was talking about. But we knew whatever this college place was, (laughs) we were supposed to be going. And so my counselor informed me that I, my grades were going to be, would probably be a challenge for me. But she was determined to help me get in because I was determined that I had to go. And she did just that. She kept searching after I received rejection letter after rejection letter. You know, here's more devaluing. Um, You know, I already know. I know. I want to scream. People, I know. (laughs) I know my ACT scores are horrible. 
but I am college material. Yes. And how do you how do you let people know that through an application that you mail? So the school that I winded up going to, the University of Illinois uh, Circle Campus, they had a special program for people like me. And my counselor made sure that I applied. And it required an oral and written uh, entry first. That was, that was awesome. But when I got there, and this will be the last thing I can, I'll share with you about the whole devaluing thing. But when I got there, uh, after my sophomore year, I declared, I went, went to declare my major in elementary education because just like I knew I was going to college, I always knew that I was going to be a teacher. And so there was no reason to wait. So I went to the College of Education, and I will never, ever forget this woman, just like I will never forget the people, other people that contributed to those ways of demeaning me. But I, I, I remember them now in a different way, and that's a good thing for me. Uh, but when I walked in and I presented the, the document, she looked through my folder, and she looked up at me over her glasses, and she said, According to your ACT scores, you would not have lasted here a quarter. And yet you've been here two years. And she didn't say it like, oh, that's wonderful. This is exciting. She said it like, I can't believe that you actually have lasted. And Melody, not only did I last, I only made A's and B's. Yeah. But this woman could have caused me to turn around and say, you know what? Why am I trying? I can't do anything because I'm black. I can't do anything right because I'm a woman. I can't do anything because my ACT scores are not high as everybody else's. What do you people want from me? Mm -hmm. I just want the same thing everybody else wants. But... I was raised by two strong parents from the South. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And that, that was just not in my uh, DNA to give up. It, it simply motivated me more to be able to show that I was not that person that's on that paper. And the treasure that you were holding inside of you was screaming out to be released. Yeah. And so no matter how much outward lids that were put on you, that who you really were on the inside of you was screaming out and saying, I will not be conformed to this. This is not true. I know what I have. I know my passions. I know my voice. And I love how you shared uh, about the clerk who believed in you. I loved how you shared about that counselor who refused to look at the grades, but recognize that you were college material. Were there any other individuals in your life that saw your value and worth that really helped to pull that treasure out of you? Yeah, well, besides my mom and dad, I mean, I, I, I really can't give them, there's not, a, there's not enough words or amount of times that I could say how blessed I was to have the parents that I had because mm-hmm. even after divorce they still were united in uh, making sure that my sisters and I felt our worth and so that that's so crucial yes. uh, and it has been so important uh, in my life. I also had some very strong aunts um, my mother's sisters and then my mother's aunts, a few of them were very uh, instrumental in my life and they all had different things that were important to them and they would deposit those things in me. Um, I had an aunt who was very hospitable and she loved caring for people and she taught me that. You know, she she showed and modeled that gift mm. for caring and how mm. it made you feel good. Mm-hmm. You know, the person that was receiving the care would benefit, certainly, but you also benefited. Yes. Um, I had an aunt who also cared for people, but she was one of those good old 
doctors without a, a MD. <laughs> and she knew how to, to take care of any ailment you had. Um, and she shared that. Uh, so I watched these strong women um, who I have, who I learned later had all kind of obstacles that they had to overcome and issues that they were dealing with themselves. But they were able to still be able to say to me, they used to call me Mella. Um, all right, Mella, you can do this. Aww. All right, Mella, we're proud of you. Aww. And that was, that was so important to me. Um, but outside of my family and the, the counselor and the, the clerk at the store, um, there was one other person who was very instrumental in seeing my uh, value and worth and shaping my view. And that was the manager of a store, that another store that I worked for. I worked for Sears for six years, six and a half years. Um, and I started in high school when I was 16. <laughs> And uh, obviously you had a good work <laughs> ethic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I learned that from my parents. Um, and so, but what happened was after that incident with the other store and um, having to leave it, I had to leave like after the Christmas holiday. So that summer I was so bored and I wanted to work. I, I wanted to work. I wanted to be able to have money to give to my mom and, and to be able to do certain things that, you know, at this point now, because of my parents' divorce, um, things were a little bit hard for us. We, you know, so anyway, um, I went to the store to apply for a job and I put down my real age. <laughs> I said, well, I've learned enough now. I'm not going to hell. <laughs> I am not going to lie this time. So I put down my real, you know, birth year and all of that. And the manager came out and she called my name. There were several people uh, out there uh, in the personnel office. And uh, she comes out, very tall, beautiful black woman. And she comes to the counter and, and my last name was Knight. And she says, Melody Knight. And I kind of shyly, you know, put my hand up and she says, could you come to the counter, please? And I came and she said, I just wanted to see the young lady who was 15 who applied for a job. Aww. She said, and uh, though I'm excited that you would like to work for Sears, you're too young. But I promise you, mm. when you make 16, I'm going to hire you. Aww. And so that was in the summertime, and my birthday was November 28th. Um, and so I said, are you serious? I mean, she didn't know me. She had That was the only time she had seen me, the only conversation uh, she ever had with me. But obviously, she felt that if I was, I felt that strongly about working, mm -hmm. and I was 15, that she was willing to take a chance on me. And sure enough, when I made 16, the very next day, I was back. Wow. <laughs> and I started working there. And I worked through the rest of high school. I worked all through college except for my last year when I was doing my student teaching. She gave me a six-month leave because she wanted me to complete that and not have, you know, work interference. I went back after I graduated. And I was teaching summer school and working there. Then I stopped. Then they opened another store a couple years later. And she called me up and she asked me would I come and help them open the store. Wow. So I just, I, I just love that lady. Um, because, you know, after years of feeling like, I don't think anybody's ever going to take me serious. I don't think anybody's ever going to realize that I am smart, yes. that I have gifts. Yeah. Um, there were people like her on the outside, because, you know, you expect your family <laughs> to say wonderful things about you. But when people outside of you yes. can see your potential, um, it is so awesome. And really, that's the woman that you've become. Tell me about 
how those things shaped. I know you were in the educational field. Tell me a little bit about that and how you use that to generate value as well as how you generate value in others today. Sure. Well, you know, from a a little girl, because I was surrounded by educators, um, I always wanted to be a teacher. I also had some really awesome teachers that uh, touched my life. Mm. And so they kind of, you know, uh, affirmed for me that, yeah, this is what I want to do. I want to make I want to make children feel smart. Mm. Uh, I I want to, I want to help that child like me Mm -hmm. who cowers down in her seat because she's afraid to say the right answer because something in her mind and people have made her think that it's the wrong answer. And so I wasn't able to articulate all of those things until I got ready to actually go into college and was still convinced that this is what I wanted to do. And I realized that all of these uh, negative experiences Mm -hmm. that I had had actually been a good thing because they affirmed for me what my calling was. And that was to pull other children up that had been beaten down. And so, um, I first started to really become our purpose. Oh my God. Yes, 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 indeed. Um, I first started my career in the uh, Catholic school system and I, I worked there for six years and, and then I moved to the public school system, which is what I really had wanted to do because I was basically with the exception of those two years in the Lutheran high school, I was a product of the Chicago public school system. And I wanted to teach in it. And I not only wanted to be a part of it as an educator, I wanted to teach in uh, a community of children that looked like me. Mm. I felt that my my gifts and my experience would really give me uh, what was needed to feel what they might be experiencing uh, as opposed to going somewhere else. And um, the latter part of my uh, teaching career, the last 20 or so years, I winded up living in the community where I was teaching and became a principal. By the time I became an assistant principal and then went on to be the principal of that same school, I could walk to the school from my house. Mm. And that was certainly rare, (laughs) but, you know, a long time ago, I had always heard that uh, the doctor and the teacher and the lawyer and everybody all lived in the same community. Uh, And and then people began to move away. Well, I was invested in that community. I raised my children there. Uh, My children at a point would go to the Y with some of the kids I taught. They were on the basketball teams and baseball teams and stuff with kids I taught. (laughs) So I would not only see them Monday through Friday, I would see them on Saturdays and Sundays at games or in the community at the grocery store or the department stores and and things like that. So I was, I, I, by the time I retired, I had taught generations, you know, I had taught children whose moms I had taught. And it it was just so wonderful. And I loved it. I would not have changed anything about it because it gave me a chance to look at a lot of melodies uh, over the uh, 38 years. It gave me a chance to um, see some of my students come to work for me Mm -hmm. when I became the principal as teachers, as lunchroom attendants. I had a a student that had been a clerk and security guards. And so what a wonderful thing to be able to say that you were able to motivate people so much that they wanted to work for you when they got older. That is being a value generator (laughs) right there. And actually, I do Mm want to say, you are the mom of Ernest Krim, and I interviewed Mm -hmm. Ernest before, and it's through him (laughs) that I wanted to interview you because 
uh, you invested into a lot of children, but you also invested into your own in such a way that they have become not only successful, but they too are value generators. And so yeah. I applaud that because everything you overcome has given you an earned authority to impact the lives of others, to be able to have such empathy and such compassion that it's motivated you to action, to impact a generation, even your own children. And that is just so impressive, Melody. I am just so honored that you have been a part of this interview. And before we close, is there anything you feel you want to say to this audience? Well, first of all, I again want to thank you. Uh, as I've shared with you before, um, uh, your encouragement of my son uh, blesses me. Um, you know, it is expected that as parents, again, that we encourage and motivate our own children. But when others see their words so true. and help them spread their wings, it, it, it makes you feel good and it makes you know that maybe you did something right. So mm -hmm. I just want to thank you so very much for being someone special in my son's life. I can certainly see your work together really going far. Um, he's excited, you know, mostly my son has always only had friends his age. And so, you know, now he's like, Ma, you know, I got friends your age now. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's awesome. He's understanding that wisdom is important too. <laughs> well, and partnership, we are better together generationally racially, mm -hmm. uh, a gender, yes. uh, so yes. many things. When we partner together with others who are different than us, we mm -hmm. actually become better and we have a greater ability to influence our world for good because we're modeling a higher way of thinking, a higher way of living and leading. And that's, that is actually contagious in our world. Yeah. I love working with millennials. I love working with <laughs> different races. Too. It's just, it's so fulfilling yes. and it's so impacting. Well, thank yes. you so much, Melody. It is an honor to know another Melody. And yes. uh, I appreciate you. I honor you and I celebrate you. Thank you so much thank for being a part of the so Stop much. Devaluation Movement. I want to thank you for listening and encourage you to become a part of the Stop Devaluation Movement. Be sure to like and follow hashtag Stop Devaluation on social media, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and visit StopDevaluation.com for more information and free resources. You can help spread the movement by sharing with others, leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, and most of all, by living a courageous lifestyle of using your power for good. Go out and value someone today. Your life matters and you can make the world a better place. One word, one choice, one action of validation at a time.